Good day, everyone. I am Romerico Gonzalez, Eric for short. My topic for today is about the various drilling contracting models. This is a small topic under a much broader subject of operations in drilling management. I am a geologist by profession. I started work on geothermal nearly 40 years ago, initially with Energy Development Corporation, wherein I started with geosciences and later on moved to oil drilling. In 2011, when Thermoprime Drilling Corporation was formed, I worked as a senior advisor for geosciences. It is common knowledge to all of us that drilling is the most expensive undertaking in geothermal development with anything from 35% to 65% of the total share of the capital costs. Many projects have been stopped, are sold, or placed on hold for lack of funds or for exceeding the budget. Some have lingered for a long time due to lack of technical capability, often as a result of failed drilling. Thermoprime considers operations as one of the three pillars of drilling management. Well planning is the second crucial pillar. All studies, designs, planning, and preparations are done here. Well planning can take years of work before actual drilling takes place. Not all groups can afford to have a well planning group, nor some do not have the experience and expertise to actually do quality planning work. Procurement is the third crucial pillar in drilling management. Getting the right items at the right price and at the right time. Contracts, people, services, materials, and equipment. There is a saying, do not start drilling if you do not yet have the bolt. And so for the lack of a bolt, the well was lost. In this talk, I will limit the topic to contracting schemes in operations for a proper introduction to this subject. At the end of this talk, I want all of, for all of you to have a better perspective on these contracting models, and it is important for you to realize and, understanding, and understand this before you engage in. In the literature review, I considered organizations having access to drilling information. These are the following. The World Bank and its partner SMAP, the IGA and the WGC papers, the GEA and the GRC, the U.S. Department of Energy's Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy Office, the European Geothermal Energy Council with its European Geothermal Congress, and the European Technology Innovation Platform, Deep Geothermal, and ETIP Renewable Heating and Cooling. Educational institutions are also rich sources of information and there are too many to cite. For oil and gas, the SPE, the IADC, the International Oil and Gas Producers Association. The more common parameters for drilling success are summarized here. One is initial success rate. How many of the first wells are successful? These are 40% for geothermal and 20% for oil and gas. If you maintain drilling costs and timelines to acceptable levels by proper planning, procurement, and operations, you help nurture your relationship with your stakeholders. Total costs after drilling will show in the financials and can significantly alter your business model. You as developers should always remember this. This is a backgrounder about Thermoprime and the context in which it came to be. The Philippine government created the Philippine National Oil Company in response to the oil crisis of 1973. PNOC then created Energy Development Corporation for Geothermal and Exploration Corporation for Oil and Gas Development. Also formed to assist were Energy Drilling Incorporated for drilling and Energy Supply Base for storage. With these companies, a succession of geothermal power plants were commissioned from 1979 to 1997, or 22 years. The commissioning were accomplished after geoscientific studies and completing the drilling, pipeline, power plant, and transmission line construction. Initially, the NPC operated exclusively the power plants, and steam produced was sold to NPC under a steam sales agreement. 
Afterwards, the new BO build operate transfer law allowed independent power producers to enter. Under the BOT law, the IPP tendered the power plants to potential partners. The winning partners will build, operate, and transfer the plant to the IPP. The partner will operate the plant for at least 10 years to recover costs and realize profit. The IPP will then sell the steam to the partner. The partner will convert and sell electricity to the IPP, and the IPP will sell the electricity transmitted to NPC at the interface. The IPP will op operate under the BOT for 25 years and transfer the plant to the government through NPC. In the meantime, PNOC EDI was subsumed by EDC in, in 1985 and was called Energy Drilling Division. The privatization of PNOC EDC commenced in 2006, and by 2007, first gen of the Lopez Holdings was in full control of PNOC EDC, now called simply EDC. In 2010, the Well Engineering Department and the Energy Drilling Division were merged, and by 2011, Thermoprime was formed as an independent corporation. This is a time-based drawing of the previous slide. Each colored bar represents a single power plant commissioned in that year with the corresponding installed capacity. All the big plants are single flash condensing power plants. A colored bar, on the other hand, less than 20 megawatts is either a binary or biphase power plant. All the power plants are supplied with steam for electricity production. The line shows the cumulative installed capacities with time. Two periods of rapid increase in capacities can be seen. The first from 1979 to 1987 represents firstly the Tiwi and Makban power plants. The resources here was first managed by Unocal, then Chevron, and now by the Philippine Geothermal Production Company. The power plants were owned and operated by NPC until 2009 when this was, these were sold to Aboitis Power. Also in the same period uh, are represented the Tongonan, Palimpinon, and Bakman power plants. The resources here are managed by PNOC EDC which supplied steam to NPC who owned the power plants. The second period is from 1993 to 2003 and shows the 660 megawatts BOT Malitbog, Upper Mahiao, Mahanagdong, as well as the 220 megawatts Mount Apo plants and the smaller late optimization plants of less than 20 megawatts. Assuming a modest 5 megawatt output per well for all the locations, one can glean the number of wells drilled to produce the total installed capacity of 2,088 megawatts. It is 418 production wells. Add to this 50% for injection wells and you get 627 production and injection wells. This excludes the exploration wells drilled in other geothermal prospects. In 2009, the total count was 888 production and injection wells. That's all what 40 years of experience can bring you. I have shown this slide the last time I was here in Taiwan. This basically shows the different phases of geothermal from prospecting to reclamation or abandonment in some literature. You can compare this to a similar drawing by SMAP and they are essentially the same. This drawing shows the main questions asked and the progressing steps needed to answer those questions. More importantly, this shows in red reports needed to progress to the next phase. I will limit my discussion only until exploration. Prospecting involves a country or regional level rapid assessment of the available resources and government agencies typically undertake this type of survey. The end product is a ranking of the resources for further work. Next, I had to divide uh, exploration into surface and subsurface because of the large amount of information required in this phase. The surface exploration intends to produce a first pass model of the subsurface geothermal system using the integrated results of geology, geophysics, and geochemistry. This is your 1P and 3G. Note that this table was made with a typical water-dominated geothermal system in mind. This means that the system must have 
a heat source. It must have permeable structures to allow fluid movement, fluid supply to allow heat transfer, and possibly a cupping mechanism to hold the fluids in place. Not all systems are the same and you should attempt to develop your own concept of the resource which will guide you in determining which exploration tools are needed to come up with a model. The surface exploration report, if favorable, should identify exploration drilling sites. Your 1P model is an idea unless it is physically proven. The obvious purpose of drilling exploration wells is to prove or disprove your 1P model. Drilling performance, subsurface geology, well testing and measurements, geochemical sampling and analysis, reservoir engineering, and initial resource assessment will produce an enhanced or revised 1P model. This will assist you in coming up uh, with the succeeding technical and financial related reports essential for the next phase. These are some definitions we will need to use in drilling in order for us to have a common frame of reference. The operator is the owner of the geothermal resource, also called the developer in the Philippines. Turnkey is the drilling of a well on a lump sum fixed cost basis. The contractor takes full control of the drilling and all the risks. Footage is the drilling of a well or hole interval on the basis of a fixed cost per foot drill. Day work is the drilling of a well where the rig is paid on a daily rate. In here, the contractor is responsible for the surface activities while the operator is responsible for anything that happens in the subsurface. Also, we have third-party services, which are services such as drilling fluids or cementing that are normally contracted separately from the drilling rig. And we also have long lead items. These are materials such as casing, well heads, that may require six months or more from the time of order to the time of delivery. This table shows you the professional, technical, and general and administrative or GNA services that you require uh, when drilling a well. The columns to the right are the consumables and third-party services that you will also need in order to complete your drilling. In here, we have the various drilling strategy models. Model one is totally in-source or in-house. Model two is conventional internal drilling department with contracted services. Model three, drilling project management with separately contracted services. This is your DPM. Model four is integrated project management or IPM, while model five is turnkey. There are numerous variations on these five models chosen to suit the operator's needs. Some required services such as HR, finance, administration, and HSE may be partly internal and partly outsourced. These models will be explained in detail in the following slides. Model one, totally insourced or in-house. The operator directs employee, uh, rather the operator and direct employees manage the entire drilling process, including ownership of the rig and many of the usual third-party services. The geothermal development company in Kenya is a good example. EDC operated this way when they were part of PNOC. Some specialized services may be contracted, for example, directional drilling. The model has fallen into disuse in the oil and gas industry. The main reason is that ownership of the rigs tend to drive drilling rather than the need for additional resources, leading to the drilling of unnecessary wells. This is known as keeping the rigs busy. The major disadvantage is that being a closed system limits the inflow of new ideas and technologies. The administration here is complex as this requires financial and technical support for the various drilling, rig crew, and third-party services having varying degrees or levels of experience and technical know-how. Model 2, Conventional Internal Drilling Department with Contracted Services. The operator has its own internal drilling department, usually composed of a drilling manager, drilling engineers, well site supervisors, and materials and logistics staff. This is the usual practice in geothermal as it allows the operator to take advantage 
of financial and non-financial incentives given by the government to you as a regional renewable energy developer. <clears throat> Make sure that you know these incentives and that you are able to take advantage of it. <clears throat> Drilling services are tendered and contracted individually. The drilling department handles all of the technical and admin part of the tender and bid evaluation process. Commercial evaluation is done by procurement and drilling. Materials, supplies, and consumables may either be bought directly by the owner or be provided by the third-party technical service. <clears throat> this model is best suited to a medium to large organization with a steady drilling base load. When the, there is an increase in activity, this is handled by the use of consultants. There is a good capture of learning since the staff are permanent. Administration is complex and is similar to that described in Model 1. Model 3, Drilling Project Management with Separately Contracted Services. The function of the drilling department is outsourced to a contractor specializing in drilling project management. This DPM company provides the staff who are usually his employees just like in a conventional drilling department. Drilling services are tendered and contracted individually. All parts of the tender and bid evaluation process is handled by the DPM contractor. The DPM contractor and the operator jointly evaluate the commercial proponent. The operator approves the award, thus keeping contractors at arm's length by the DPM contractor. This is because the DPM contractor is free to act in the operator's best interest since there is no direct link to the third-party services contractors. This is best suited to small operators with intermittent drilling or with larger operators who at the begin who are at the beginning of activities or are conducting operations in areas with intermittent activity. Large oil and gas companies in remote or low activity areas often use this scheme. Simpler administration of the GNA is available for the operator because he often times already has an existing GNA group. The capture of learning is much less for the owner since drilling staff is transient. Knowledge base is restricted to retain documentation. Model 4 Integrated Project Management or IPM. The function of the drilling department is outsourced to a large service company providing integrated drilling project management. These are usually Slumberjay, Halliburton, Baker Huge, Weatherford, Great Wall. The outsourced IPM contractor provides the staff who are employees in a conventional drilling department together with all of the third-party services. Hence, the IPM contractor becomes the operator by proxy. The operator simply administers the IPM contract and pays the IPM contractor for all work rendered. Third-party services are all provided by the IPM contractor. The IPM contractor may also sometimes provide the rig. In recent years, we have seen tenders come out with the rig owner as the lead bidder and covering third-party services. In here, the rig owner either tenders and subcontracts third-party service providers or the rig owner maintains these third-party services. In this model, the biggest disadvantage is that the control of the use of the services is no longer at arm's length. This is so because a direct financial link exists between the drilling management, making decisions, and the services required. This method has been subject to some abuse in the past. The larger oil companies in remote or low activity areas, for this reason, rarely use this. Capture of learning is much less since drilling staff is strengthened. Knowledge base is restricted to retain documentation. The documentation's utility may be compromised by the IPM contractor's self-serving justifications. Model 5, Turnkey. The operator provides the turnkey contractor with the well location 
depth, and targets. The turnkey contractor delivers a drilled well and completes it for a fixed cost and assumes all the risks. These risks include formation-related drilling problems, such as stock pipes, loss in hole instances, sloughing formation, loss circulation sections, or high-pressure zones, as well as surface operating issues with the rig, the service providers, the other equipment, and including manpower. This model is very rare or non-existent in the geothermal industry for reasons mainly associated with costing of the drilling risks. A common oil and gas variant on this is partial turnkey, where the well is drilled on footage to just above the top of the reservoir, after which the operator takes control and manages the operations. The capture of learning is much less since drilling staff is transient. Knowledge base is restricted to retained documentation. The rewards are high for the turnkey contractor if he makes the right pricing assessment before drilling. This slide shows the responsibility matrix for the five models for professional and technical services, consumables, and third-party services. Depending on the operator's risk profile, it may provide more value if model X is chosen over model Y using the table. The operator should carefully study these risks in order to be prepared for any eventuality. The owner may opt to distribute the risk, pay his way out of it, or enroll the services of a risk-reducing package. The matrix can provide combinations suitable to the operator. It may also be that rules and regulations in the country only allows certain portions of functions within the matrix. You should understand how each and every function works so that you may be able to judiciously determine the suitability and appropriateness of any or part of the models shown. Now you may ask what to use among those models. <clears throat> this table provides a possible method for selecting the appropriate model for any possible variant. The key items to look for are sufficient financial control by the operator over any activity during drilling, the presence and availability of technical experts who are free to work in the activity, and a scheme to record, collate, and store information and reports that may be obtained prior to, during, and after the drilling activity. Depending on how the operator is designed as a company, Strategies for small operators and medium to large operators are available, provided the needs and wants are explicitly codified and that the ways and means on how to meet these needs and wants are clear and understood by all in the company. This slide is an example of how an operator can recover from a previously drilled well with poor performance using a tweak from an existing relationship. The original IPM contractor, by the way, this is an oil and gas contract, was deficient in cost control during the drilling. This is compounded by the lack of knowledge of the area and by the lack of expertise of the IPM contractor. The owner provided a knowledgeable person or KP who provided that much needed leadership in drilling operations management. In short, the operator contracted a separate DPM, actually a lone individual having knowledge of the area and equipped with the necessary skills and capability. With that move, drilling performance thereafter very much improved. This can be seen in the vast difference in the depth versus day graph in the lower right-hand corner. The previous performance is in the red and the performance of the KP when on board is in black. In addition, there was a very close correlation in the DVD between the program and the actual KP's performance, an indication of knowledge of the area. Of course, this KP provided the green program in the DVD graph. Moreover, the independence of the KP relative to the IPM's third-party service contractors provided the requisite arm's length 
by allowing better management and financial control of these third-party contractors, particularly during periods where their services were not needed or were on standby and waiting for instructions. In this part, and in, as well as in the succeeding slides, we'll show how closely the models previously described follow real actual examples. In this slide, three examples using EDC in various contracting schemes with TDC. All, by the way, are active contracts. With the disposal of EDC's two rigs and their acquisition by Thermoprime, coupled with the day rate contracts plus an allowance for capital recovery, both parties satisfactorily serviced each other's needs profitably. The next two examples are both manpower service contracts with one rig in operation and providing maintenance services to the other rig in the other contract. Both contracts utilize Thermoprime's manpower and their expertise in operating and maintaining drilling rigs. All three examples are Model 2 with conventional internal drilling department coming from EDC and with the contracting services coming from Thermoprime. With the knowledge, expertise, and institutional, or rather, with the experience, expertise, and institutional knowledge we have at Thermoprime, we now have averages of 2,800 2, meters drilling for 50 days. In this slide, the first example is a Model 3 with drilling project management having separately contracted services. Uh, the operator does not have a drilling department. An experienced drilling engineer was hired to handle the contracting and drilling management of the project. While the owner wanted to deal with only one entity, the owner also wanted to have a better control over long lead time and high value materials such as casings and beads, as well as develop a better contracting scheme with the contractor's third-party service providers. The second example is with my Barara Geothermal using Model 2 with a conventional drilling department and contracting department. This is a drilling services contract. The owner required drilling services consisting of a rig with crew as well as third-party services and materials and supplies requirements. All these were tendered separately. The drilling services was on a day rate basis. The last example is with Mabini Geothermal and is similar in many aspects to the second contract. This last slide are all examples of model two contracting. Two contracts here are for geothermal with one workover for a local company and the other is drilling for a foreign company. One contract is for local oil and gas drilling. In all examples, the owner had their own well engineering departments. All three required separate contracts for the rig with crew, the third party services, and the procurement of consumables. The oil and gas contract had the option for the contractor to use their own rig with crew, and another option of having the contractor use the owner's rig with the contractor's crew. The foreign contract required mobilization and demobilization between the Philippines and Indonesia. Local corporate and labor laws in Indonesia require foreign contractors to have a local partner, and work visas are allowed only to the most senior drilling personnel, while the rest of the crew are locals. In all these three examples, day rates were to be used. For all the nine examples shown here, Rig move within the project and between two or more projects are covered by the contractor. These rig moves are paid by the operator on a lump sum basis where the activity has to be completed in a specified number of days and guaranteed by the contractor. Adjustments for long distance land rig moves between a fix, beyond a fixed distance and additional days while onboard a sea transport beyond a fixed number of days are guaranteed in the arrangement. A last note, <clears throat> efforts to manage drilling risks involve lowering the chances of failure and drilling costs. 
Failure in the geothermal context is the non-alignment of a targeted initially arbitrary megawatt output. The output is a function of the enthalpy of the, and the mass flow, with the flow being affected by the last casing set and the reservoir volume. In the absence of a megawatt value, being the first well obviously, at least reaching the target may be used as a gauge for success. Drilling cost is a function of procurement costs vetted by optimal planning in the well design and the drilling program, and in the drilling execution and operating efficiency, all done to improve the chances of success. Thank you for your time and the opportunity to present Thermoprime Drilling Operations Management. Congratulations and more power to the organizers. We hope we can continue with these operations and see you soon in Taiwan.